Hello, I'm joined by Brian Bromberg of the Bromberg Law Office. He has been a consumer protection attorney since 1999, and we're going to learn about some of the different topic areas that he works with consumers. Brian, thanks for being with us. Can you tell us a little bit about some of the issues that are most affecting consumers in your practice? I'd have to say the issues that are most affecting consumers uh, include debt collection issues, uh, where consumers are being harassed by debt collectors, uh, situations in which consumers are being frequently targeted with robo-dialed calls on their cell phones, uh, and they're being victimized that way. Uh, I'd say a final area of law is just where their credit reports are being completely messed up, uh, whether as a result of identity theft uh, or as a result of where their accounts are being mixed or being merged, mismerged with other consumers. So those are, I'd say, the top areas of problems right now. And some of those last issues that you mentioned, those would fall under the Fair Credit Reporting Act? Yes, they would. And can you tell us a little bit more about that? Well, the Fair Credit Reporting Act protects consumers from inaccurate reporting. Uh, the basic concept is that, let's say someone reports a credit card that doesn't belong to you onto your credit report. Uh, someone opened an account in your name. You go, you make a police report, you file a dispute with the credit reporting agencies, and they should take that false item off of your credit report. But frequently they don't, and frequently you suffer damages. You can't get credit, you can't get loans, you can't open a new credit card, you can't get a business loan. These are the kinds of things that can destroy people's lives. And my job as a consumer protection lawyer, when people are faced with a situation, is if they go and they dispute it with the credit reporting agencies, and the credit reporting agencies should take it off and don't take it off, and as a result the consumer is denied credit, I step in and I sue the credit reporting agencies. I sue the company that put the false information on there and refused to take it off, that put on the credit card that shouldn't have been on there, that was the result of identity theft. I sue these companies to try and put people back in the position they should have been in, so they can go out and get the credit they need for their business, so they can go out and get that student loan they need to go to school, or their son can get that student loan they need to go to school, or their daughter. Um, and these are the kinds of things that can destroy people's lives, but I can come in and hopefully I can straighten things out, help the people straighten them, out for, straighten them out for themselves. And you mentioned several issues related to someone's credit history, and one of the things that you mentioned as possibly affecting credit history is identity theft. Identity theft is a huge issue. There are, the Consumer Finance Protection Bureau gets tons of complaints about identity theft issues. Basically, it's someone's impersonating you. Uh, they come in, they open an account under your name, they rack up debt, they don't pay the debt, uh, they have items shipped to their homes. You have to go in, get a police report, put in the disputes with the credit reporting agencies, send a copy to the company that put the false information on there, get the entire fraud investigation uh, mechanism started, get them moving. And if your identity's been stolen and you put in these disputes and they don't take it off and you get denied credit as a result, there could be a good lawsuit there. No one's gonna get rich on these cases, but by the same token, you get this off your credit report, this, this false reporting of someone who's stolen your identity, it can give people a fresh start. I've seen it give people a fresh start. They can then get lines of credit for their businesses. They can turn their lives around. Instead of being a victim, they can come in and they can be the victor. They can triumph over the people who've stolen their identities. One of the areas in which you help consumers is responding to debt lawsuits. What happens when a consumer is hit with a debt lawsuit? Well, frequently consumers will get hit with debt lawsuits by debt buyers, by companies that have paid pennies on the dollar for a debt or pennies on the dollar for an ancient judgment. Um, and the consumer will look at this and go, oh my God, I don't even know what this is. 
I don't recall having this credit card. I thought this credit card was paid in full. What is this? Uh, frequently they'll come to me after a judgment's already been entered against them. Uh, after, after someone pretended to have served a summons and complaint years ago and got a judgment entered, they'll come to me and say, you know, what is this? I don't even know what to do here. So what I will do is they'll pay me to come into state court and to defend the lawsuit or to try and vacate the judgment and get the case thrown out. But at the very least, if they do nothing and just let their wages be garnished or let their, uh, let their bank accounts be frozen and have money taken, uh, they're just going to be behind the eight ball. Um, I've had situations with clients come into me with 15-year-old judgments they never knew existed on debts they thought they had been paid off. And I'll come in, I'll vacate the judgment, I'll get the case thrown out. And they're in much better shape at that point because uh, a $4,000 judgment that's 15 years old can balloon to 10 grand in no time. And this is part of trying to get somebody to reset back to the point before they had these negative debt issues. Exactly. Uh, these are debts they may or may not owe. People do not know frequently what they owe and don't owe, especially on these ancient debts. Debts that were the result of what they call sewer service, where they were never actually handed the summons and complaint. The summons and complaint just went into the sewer. And this has been a huge problem in New York, these sewer service cases, on ancient debts that no one knows whether they're owed or not. Brian, can you tell us a little bit about robocalls, how they're used, and why they're illegal? Well, there's a statute called the Telephone Consumer Protection Act, uh, the TCPA for short, and the, the law dates back to 1991, and one of the things in the law is that you cannot use an automated dialing system to call a telephone number where the recipient has to pay for the call, and that includes a cell phone. A cell phone is a system where you have to pay for the receipt of the calls. Okay, you have a certain number of minutes, maybe unlimited minutes, but at the end of the day, you are paying for the receipt of those calls. And that's illegal. You cannot, without prior express permission, you cannot robo-dial. Um, now, now, these are very complicated cases. If, if you have been robo-dialed, and you can find the people that did it to you, those calls are worth 500 to 1,500 for every robo-dialed call. Um, the problem is that a lot of companies have started writing in contractual provisions allowing the robo-dialing of these calls now. Uh, so, so in the very long terms of service, Somewhere in there, they're trying to say, we have the ability to robocall you? Yes, they're trying to get people to give up their rights. So when you sign up for your credit card, they've got a little provision in there saying that we can call your cell number without further express permission. Uh, and that's become a big problem. That's allowed a lot of big corporations to get away with robo-dialing now. Uh, before, when they would robo-dial, they'd get caught and they'd have to pay money. Now a lot of these big companies can get away with it. It's a problem. Uh, no one's quite sure what to do with the problem, uh, but it has become a big problem because now there's the illusion that you agreed to receive the, lo the calls, but really you didn't agree. And how about in areas where you haven't agreed, but I understand sometimes it's very hard to actually find who's making the call. Or if, track down the caller. If you can track down the caller, if you can track down the person who hired the company to make the call, that is a big plus. In other words, if some dentist uh, or doctor or um, real estate company or real estate broker uh, hired a service to place these robo-dialed calls to your cell phone, then frequently you can go after that person who hired the company. The companies themselves, frequently they're fly by night. You know, you could get a judgment against them, maybe, and good luck collecting on it. 
The key is if you can do a little legwork before you come to me and try and track down who actually hired the company, the local company that hired the company, the local dentist, the local doctor, the local, uh, the local car mechanic, the local warranty selling company, uh, the local real estate company, someone with actual assets and with an actual office, there's a possibility I could recover that money. But it's become more difficult, I won't lie. Yeah. And you've talked about the, the idea of a robocall being an automated call. How, what's the distinction? How do I know if I have a robocall versus just an unwanted marketing call? Well, frequently, the, practically all marketing calls being made to your cell phone are going to be robocalls. First of all, if it's a pre-recorded message, that's going to be an auto-dialed call. Sure. You know, you have a chance with your warranty. Your warranty is about to expire. We, you know, you've got to take action now. That pre-recorded call, you can be really sure that's an auto-dialed robocall. Uh, other calls, you'll frequently hear a pause between the time you pick up and the time that the person talking with you starts, starts in on their spiel, mm -hmm. starts telling you what they're trying to sell you. So there'll be that, it, it'll be obvious that that's a robocall. Um, a lot of these companies, you're not going to be able to find the, uh, find the assets. You're not going to be able to collect on the judgments unless you can track it back to uh, the company that hired the service. So if you believe that you are being harassed by robocalls, what are three steps that you should be taking? Well, first of all, try and get them to give you information about who's involved in this. You may want to talk with them and, and try and get them to have that person contact you directly. Uh, so if you want to take the time, by all means, stay on the phone with the person, try and get information or try and get a call back from the local company that hired the service. If you can get that call back and you can find out where they're located, that's someone we can go after. Okay. Again, the company that's actually placing the robo-dial call, good chance we won't be able to track them down or find their, find their assets. They could be located in anywhere. They could be located in India. They could be located in Canada. They could be tracking them down, not getting you anywhere. It's the local business that's hired this company to take the illegal act of robo-calling that is the one you want to you want to speak with directly. Maybe it's getting them to give you a call back, to set up an appointment, whatever. So if you can track them down, we can do it. The other thing is keep your call records. Keep, keep the records of all the incoming calls. Keep the records of your, your phone logs for your cell phone. Download them all from the website, you know, from the Verizon website, the AT&T website, the T-Mobile website. Download, download all the voicemails, download all the calls. Keep track of it all. And will many cell phone providers in your monthly bill, you can get a list of all your calls right there. Exactly, right? So, so download the bill, exactly. Keep the bill on your hard drive, that'll be your record, okay? Also, if you're getting calls from the same call, don't hesitate to take a screenshot. In other words, if you don't pick up but you're getting the call, the unpicked up call may not appear on your bill, but it's going to show up on your screen as a call in. Press the right buttons to take a screenshot, keep that screenshot. So another thing that you can document as part of the process, especially if you're getting multiple calls or recurring calls. Exactly, exactly. This also holds true, by the way, with debt collectors. Keep track of those calls you're getting from debt collectors. So debt collectors, you may be able to go after them for violations of the Telephone Consumer Protection Act. So keep track of those debt collection calls. Keep track of those logs and those bills. If you're getting calls that you're not picking up, keep track of the voicemails, maybe take a screenshot of the telephone number on your screen. So you have that record of when they called you and, how, and which number they called from. Because frequently with consumer protection issues, if someone has a debt related issue, records and evidence really does become important. Oh, hugely important. Yeah, records and evidence are everything in court. Because later on, 
if you don't use certified return receipt mail, there's a very good chance they're going to deny ever having received the letter. If you've got your certified return receipt, you've got proof they signed for it. Right. And that's very important when it comes time to prove that, say, you disputed the debt. You told them not to call you. You told them that you, know, you don't owe the debt. You explained that you were a victim of identity theft. You sent them a copy of your identity theft affidavit. All this stuff, certified return receipt. Keep copies of the receipts. Keep copies of the green card when it comes back. Staple it to your file copy so you don't lose it. Staple the receipt for when you mailed it. Staple that to your file copy so you don't lose it. Keep track of all this stuff. Make photocopies of any letter you send out. Don't just you know, say, oh, well, I have a copy on my computer in Word. No. After you sign it, make a photocopy. When you bring it down to the post office to send it certified return receipt, you get that certified label, staple that to your file copy. When the green card comes back for the receipt, staple that to your file copy. Brian, I understand you do a lot of work related to auto fraud issues. What are some of those issues and how do you help consumers in those areas? The auto fraud issues I tend to get most heavily involved with uh, are the ones involving financing. Uh, frequently, consumers will go to, uh, especially the consumers I represent who tend not to be very wealthy, they'll go to low-end car dealerships. And these car dealerships basically just want to get the person behind the wheel and get financing in place no matter what it takes. So they'll have the person sign up, they'll give the person uh, supposedly what they're going to be paying, they have them sign all the paperwork. Sometimes they'll have them sign the paperwork in blank and tell them that's the way it's done. That's completely illegal. Other things they'll do is uh, they'll have the person sign a contract and then the car dealership won't be able to sell the contract to a bank. So what they'll do is they'll forge a signature on a new contract and sell that contract to the bank and the contract will be for a significantly higher amount of money and they'll pocket that difference. In other words, a lot of the car dealerships that poor people go to, that they're kind of forced to go to because their credit may not be that great or they can't put that money down, that much money down, tend to really do whatever they can to rip off the consumer. And my goal as a consumer protection lawyer is to undo the transaction uh, or to try and get back the amount that the person's been ripped off and try and put them back in the position they were in before they got ripped off and maybe get them some compensation for the aggravation and the rip off and hopefully get their attorney's fees paid in the process so that they're not out substantial amounts of money. These are hard cases to litigate. You, you need an experienced lawyer. Uh, I've been doing consumer protection law since 1999. I've been a lawyer for much longer than that. You need someone who's going to pay attention to the details, someone who knows how to litigate these car cases, someone who knows how to deal with the, with the false signatures, with the forged signatures, uh, who knows how to deal with these various scams that car companies put consumers through. You need an experienced lawyer. You can call me. You can call someone else. It's got to be someone who's got experience with this particular field of law because it's very complicated. Brian, we've been talking about auto fraud. Can you explain to me a little bit more how a car dealer or a car seller can um, uh, create fraud in the sale of a vehicle? There's a common misconception about autos, about car dealers. Car dealers don't sell you a car. They don't manufacture the car. They don't sell you the car. What they're selling you is financing and a service contract. It's all a question of getting you into that loan, taking that loan and flipping it to a bank or flipping it to a finance company and getting paid for having gotten you into that loan and for lining you up and getting you 
into that deal with the bank. And so you're not paying the car dealer anymore, you're paying the business or organization that's holding your debt obligation. Well, you are paying the car dealer, but the car dealer then wants to flip it to the bank so that you're now paying the bank and they basically get a fee for having gotten you into this to begin with. And because they sell it to someone who's willing to wait to be paid or to take the payments over the life of the loan or the service agreement. Exactly. And in addition, there's the there's this service contract. They make money on the service contracts by locking you into these service contracts. They make money on that. Okay, that because really they're not manufacturing the car, so all they can do is try and, frankly, hose you by getting you into this, uh, getting you into a finance agreement on bad terms, or by uh, getting you into a service contract on bad terms. Um, that's really the only way they're going to make money. Uh, the internet has made it clear uh, how much a car is worth and what people should pay. So it's only on the financing end and the service contract end that they make their money now. And if they can't make their money on that, if they can't figure out a way of flipping that agreement to the bank uh, and taking their money out of it, then they will do very shady things. They'll tell you, for instance, that they're going to repossess your car because, because the bank wouldn't buy the contract. Oh, the financing didn't go through. No, what that means is they couldn't sell your contract to the bank and they're not happy about that and they want to get you back in to come in to pay a higher charge or to put more money down so they can get more money out of the deal. Okay, the deal has already gone through. You've already got your contract with the car dealer, but they're not happy about the fact that they can't pull their money out. So that's what you call a yo-yo sale. They say, come on back. The deal didn't go through. You're going to have to put some more money down. Oh, you're not willing to come to come back? We're going to repossess your car. We're going to make your life hell. You're going to screw up your credit. So these are the kinds of shady practices. Other things they'll do, we'll forge a signature on the contract with terms that are more advantageous to us, where you're paying more money, you're paying a higher interest rate, and then with that higher amount on there, we'll sell that to the bank and we'll pocket the difference. Uh, other things they do, they'll put down false down payments. You only put down 1500 for the car or 2500 for the car and they'll put down that you put down 5000 Complete bank fraud. It's a violation of the Truth in Lending Act. It's a violation of various consumer protection laws, but they'll do this and now you're paying, you're paying sales tax on this, you're paying uh, financing on all these pumped up numbers on the, you know, on the higher price that they put down on the forge contract, or you're paying sales tax on the higher, uh, on the higher fake down payment. All these little scams to try and get their money out of this. Get you into the car, get your trade in, take away your ability to move around, get you into this new car, and figure out how they can pop the most money out of this deal. Completely illegal, happens every day. And the threats to repossess a car, also completely illegal. If they forged your signature, if they, uh, if they couldn't get the loan sold to a finance company, but they're trying to repossess your car, all this stuff is very illegal. But very few lawyers will know how to deal, this, deal with this stuff. You need someone with experience. I mean, I've been doing this consumer protection law. I've been dealing, I've been dealing with these cases since 1999, these consumer protection cases. Uh, I've been dealing with, uh, I've been a lawyer now years longer than that. You need someone with experience in this field. Most lawyers will not even recognize these violations. You gotta come to someone with experience. You gotta call me, call someone else with experience, but don't just leave it alone. Brian, I understand that you are a class action attorney. Class actions are a way of a group of people coming together to help other people. When a single person's been ripped off 
for $25. It's not worth pursuing a lawsuit. Only a madman would pursue a lawsuit for $25. But when $25 has been stolen from one person and it's been stolen from 10,000 other people or 20,000 other people, suddenly the numbers start to make more sense. Suddenly if that one person can come forward and represent those 10,000 or 20,000 or million people who've been ripped off to the tune of $25 each, suddenly it makes sense to step forward and to try and help those people. Uh, so the goal of a class action is when it's not practicable, when it doesn't make sense to have everyone together bringing you know, little $25 lawsuits which make no sense financially. But all these people have been ripped off $25 and the company has made a killing. The company's made a fortune with these illegal acts. One person can step forward as a class representative and say, you know what, enough is enough. And tell that bank or tell that credit card company or tell that car dealership, you know what, you can't keep doing this to people you'd figure that no one's gonna step forward for 25 bucks, and you're right. But guess what? I'm here representing these 10,000 people, these 20,000 people, these 1 million people that you ripped off. And this is gonna stop now. And you're gonna pay these people back their 20, 25 dollars. Every one of them, you're gonna pay it back. And going forward, maybe you'll think twice next time about doing this. Now, the person who represents the class gets the benefit of having been like Aaron Brockovich, having been the person who stepped forward, of having done the right thing, okay? Um, and everyone in the class gets the benefit of this person having helped out. Now sometimes the court will award a little bit of money to the class representative for having helped out. There's no guarantee of this. Uh, the courts will frequently, if someone has stepped forward and done a lot of work, they'll frequently give them a little bit of an incentive, a little bit of a service award for having stepped forward and helped people out. But there's no guarantee about this. Uh, being a class action plaintiff, the main benefit is that you have been the one to step forward. You have been the one to help people. And you have been the one to force a change in the corporate culture and to stop the acts that people are doing, okay? Um, and it can be very gratifying to be a class representative. You know that you've done the right thing, that you've, you've stepped up and you've helped people out. And you're helping many people at once, right? Because as you aggregate the, the wrong, the illegal act, that's when it really starts to make an impact, both in um, having enough of a collection of evidence to um, find wrongdoing, but also um, at this point, for example, your example of $25 times 10,000 people, I mean, that's really a lot of money that a company profited off of what later um, is found to be an illegal fee or an illegal act of some. So um, it's really important to be able to group those individuals together and fight on their behalf. I've got to tell you, I've had situations where I've sued companies for violations of various statutes, of various laws. I've sued them two, three times and they do absolutely nothing. They just keep on doing the bad acts because it's easier to pay a little bit of money to, to tell the person who's suing them to go away and just keep doing the bad act. But guess what? When I finally brought a class action against that company, suddenly they started changing their abusive letters. Suddenly they stopped charging the fee. Suddenly people pay attention when they're facing a class action with a competent lawyer behind it. Okay, regardless of whether we win or lose, the fact that we're stepping forward and we're saying, you know what, enough's enough. You've done this two, three, to two or three of my clients. These other clients are fed up. We're going forward with a class action. Suddenly, people start paying attention. Suddenly, people start following the law. 
And I've seen it happen over and over again. It takes that class action to make those companies start paying attention because you're hitting them where it hurts. You're hitting them at the bottom line. You're hitting them in their pocketbooks. Okay, Brian, the information that you shared today has been very valuable. Do you have any parting shot that you'd like to give to a consumer out there that might be dealing with some issues where they need the help of an experienced consumer protection attorney? What might you say to them? I'd say don't be afraid. You're, what you're going through is normal. Okay, these companies think a lot, of, a lot of companies that are doing things that are inappropriate, that are illegal, uh, that are abusive, they think they can get away with it. Don't be afraid, take the first step. Pick up the phone and call an experienced consumer protection lawyer. I've been doing consumer protection law since 1999. Call someone who knows what they're doing. It's a very specialized field of law. It's very focused. There's a lot to learn. There's a lot to know. Okay, you're not going to be able to look in the phone book and, and pick a lawyer at random. You want someone with experience, someone with knowledge. Okay, it may not be me. You may hire someone else. But whoever you hire, it should be someone experienced. It should be someone knowledgeable. It should be someone who knows what they're doing and has the experience and, well, the gray hair. I'm Brian Bromberg of the Bromberg Law Office. Call for a free consultation today. Pick up the phone. Take the first step. I can't reach out to you. You have to reach out to me. Call me today.